If you want to know how the best teams in the world protect themselves from nation state hacks or just uber hacking teams, especially in this world of AI, then this video will run through how we at RoboShadow protect ourselves, but will give you a good insight into how you protect large scale industrial systems from the world's best hackers. Okay, so what I'm gonna run through is how you protect a platform that is probably going to be hacked by either super advanced hackers or nation states effectively. So I'm gonna do this using the example of RoboShadow. So that's our cybersecurity platform. And although I can't guarantee that we've definitely been attempted to be hacked by nation state actors, um, it's the sort of platform that is likely to be hacked or at least have attempts to be hacked. So um, we get quite a lot of questions in terms of RoboShadow security as well. So hopefully there's a dual purpose in this video just to give people an understanding of how you would protect a platform like RoboShadow. The default things that you would do is a penetration test, which we have, CREST, cert for, uh, CREST certified penetration test. You would have some kind of compliance framework, um, like a SOC 2 would be an American version. Here in the UK, we have Cyber Essentials, which is a really good framework. I can't tell you how good it is. So if you don't have one, it really is, I think, the best sort of entry level kind of cyber practice that you should definitely look at. Um, we have the Cyber Essentials Plus, which is a completely audited um, exercise. Um, and we also are very lucky from a RoboShadow perspective because we are a microservices platform, which long story short, we have no attack surface almost. We have no servers. It's only the Amazon API gateway um, that is shown to the world. And that Amazon API gateway is used by government, military, sort of all over the world for all of the sort of GovCloud Amazon and services and stuff like that. So if that API gets hacked, um, there's a lot more problems um, in the world. Um, our attack surface is also quite small um, because we have uh, our agent is .NET. It's the latest version of .NET and we have almost no third party libraries in there. So you've almost got to be able to hack the Microsoft .NET agent to be able to hack us. Um, and the uh, all of our authentication is in Google Firebase. So um, I couldn't give you, if you had a gun to my head, I couldn't give you your password. That is all stored within um, Google Firebase. So, so that is, um, um, that is kind of the typical things that people would be looking for and the typical ways that you answer questions like this. People will also ask about, you know, have you got a SOC 2 or an ISO 27001? We actually don't have these um, compliance frameworks. Like I say, we have Cyber Essentials Plus, but we don't go for all of them globally because we are a global business. And no disrespect to these frameworks, they're just not going to help a platform like us at all. If we was really trying to be hacked, there would be almost very limited value that these um, compliance frameworks um, um, would provide to be able to help us. So all of the value in us being able to protect ourselves, we learned pretty much from our friends at the GCHQ and the National Cyber Security Center. Uh, we was part of their NCSE for startups programs effectively, uh, where we had the benefit of spending time with their security team. Uh, but other folk that we met from that program had similar air gapped type security requirements and you kind of get a feel for the levels of diligence and, and, and levels that you really need to go to um, to keep yourself safe if you run a platform like that. So I'm just gonna run through where the value really was in us trying to protect ourselves from nation state actors. So first and foremost, I'll probably start with the top bug bounty. So a pen test is a good exercise. Don't get me wrong, but they can be expensive and they're a point in time. If you have a bug bounty program, we have a completely globally open one, just like Tesla will have. Um, and that means that anyone can try and hack us from anywhere in the world and we will pay them a bounty if they send us in a bug. We have a team of people um, that manage this process for us. It does mean that you open yourself up to a lot of communication, a lot of false positives or people trying to pretend there's bugs when there's not. Um, but there is a lot of value and almost all of the value, I think, in our, should we say, attack surface um, protection comes from that bug bounty program. So you can pay people like Hacker One to do this for you. It can get quite expensive, um, but just even having an open bug bounty program, that's where a lot of value is going to come because it's not just one off hobby hackers, it's full on global teams that do this at an industrial scale. They won't just come in and do it once. If they know that you've got a constant bug bounty program, they will spider all of your platform effectively. They will know it ins and outs. They will, we give access to premium versions as well to the bug bounty teams. And every time you change code, 
They will be quick to understand that you've changed something. They will usually be able to detect it and they will then run the certain kind of processes to be able to hack, in our cases, API. So bug bounty program and opening up to the world ethical hackers, you would expect, um, all over the world to try and hack any part of your platform um, is one of the most valuable things that you can do to protect a platform like yourself. And again, it's continuous. These bug bounty teams are have continuous spiders and continuous uh, processes to keep trying to hack you and detecting every time uh, you, um, uh, you release and change code effectively. So the next one that I've got here is, is the boring one, but there's an amazing amount of value in this. So this is just the logging services. So every platform, either whether or not it's Amazon, Azure, or um, GCP, or even in fact on-prem systems, will have a capability to log things out. Now, Amazon logging can be expensive, and we will run stuff periodic, uh, periodically th like uh, through things like Datadog. Now, you need a way of managing false positives and just being able to do a bit more anomaly detection because what you really need is that if anything happens in the platform that's a bit untoward, it's not what a normal developer would do. It's not what a normal user would do. It's kind of suspicious activity. When you've got a very big platform that's got lots of moving parts, you need tools to be able to manage this for you. So these can get expensive, so you can just turn them on periodically and off just to get patterns and things like that. And you can um, minimize down the type of logs that you're actually taking. So. It's a well-known thing in cybersecurity that log management is a problem, but you can use third-party tools to help you with this, and there are ways of keeping those costs down as well. So in a similar kind of vein, the Amazon Web Services security tool sets, there's about five or six different main tools that you would use within Amazon. All of the other platforms have similar equivalents as well, and obviously for on-prem systems, you can buy third-party tools as well. But having those turned on, and Amazon will know how it's being hacked all over the world. It's constantly being hacked. So it's using those insights at that scale effectively to make sure that you've got insights to those tools. Now, again, they can be expensive if you have them turned on all of the time, but you can give yourself like a monthly or a quarterly sort of process or a refresh, turn everything on, look at the data, and then you may see, oh, this, this, is, this code could be vulnerable or this process needs updating or something like that. But using the native tools within the platform or strong third party tools, you need to be logging activity because a hacker's not just going to come in and go, click, click, we've done and you're hacked it will take lots of time probing and changing and trying things. And these days, it's not just human hackers, it's obviously AI that you're trying to battle against. These nation state actors or these got advanced hacking teams, they have access to all of the uh, the fun AI tools like the, uh, um, uh, like the ethical guys do as well. So um, the other bit um, that's probably, um, uh, probably makes sense, uh, sounds simple, but not easy to do, it's your team that's going to be hacked as well. So they will try looking at LinkedIn, looking at um, um, individuals, members of the board. They will try and hack almost anyone. So making sure that anyone that has access to business data or has any form of access to anything that could be hacked at sensitive data, you need to make sure they're on a proper seam sock process. So with us, no one's allowed to be any sort of contract or consultant machine or consultant machine or anything like that. Everyone has to be within a virtualized, what we call the wire, sort of behind the wire effectively. So you have to be locked within some kind of ring of steel on machines that are um, um, certainly imaged and software controlled on them. But more importantly, you're running some kind of SOC scene process. So whether or not you're using a CrowdStrike or a, a Huntress or, um, you know, you have a third party sock that's using Microsoft Sentinel or something like that. If something on one of your machines gets enumerated or change or some PowerShell runs, you need an alarm to go off and you need someone to ring you and say, hey, what's going on there? So, um, this can get a little bit tricky when you're working with developers because developers by nature will be trying to do lots of different things on the machine, but making sure that you're protecting your staff and there is a pretty much 24 by seven process. And again, these external seam stroke sock teams are very reasonable um, from a cost perspective um, and they will pick up the phone and ring you and say, hey, we've seen something and someone's trying to move laterally or um, we've seen a, a, an attempt on enumeration or, or something like that. Um, and the last, but by no means least, um, is just really the code base. So a very 
A uh, common way to be hacked will be supply chain, i.e. getting into your code base. It's happened with some really big name brands. For legal reasons, I won't uh, mention them, so it can happen to anyone. So we're quite lucky in RoboShadow. We don't have monolithic applications. So where we're microservices, we have very small snippets of code and each of that, so the process needs to be, developers need to check other developers' code in and that has to be a physical button press to accept and approve someone's code. Then your VP of engineering or CTO will look at it as it goes through. So usually developers are looking at for quite, uh, code quality and readability, but you're also looking at to make sure that there's no back doors in and things like that. So when you're dealing with massive, massive code bases, this can be quite difficult because it's a lot easier. This is what happened in supply chain attacks. Usually they're massive data, um, uh, massive monolithic applications with massive code bases. And it's quite easy to slip something in. We're very lucky within RoboShadow and this is a sort of tip for everyone. If you can keep all of your classes really small, our CTO gets um, um, a little bit animated if you've got more than like a hundred lines of code uh, in a class. So you can really see not just for readability, look at it from a security perspective as well. So at the same time as having your um, repository complete completely locked down, ironclad, you need to make sure that you've got tools looking at your code base. So tools like um, SNCC and within these um, code um, based repositories now, um, there's lots of AI tools that can look at people trying to put backdoors in and things like that where alarms should go off. If anyone did manage to hack a developer that got in and that tried to get a backdoor into code that then got released into production, you want to be able to pick this up um, with tools within, um, I won't tell you what we use, it's um, it's very common, it's probably quite easy to um, easy to guess, um, but ultimately um, you need to have all of these tools switched on and something like SNCC just looking at the actual code base itself. So not just the configuration of the code, is there a backdoor, a URL, an IP address or something that's been obscured or base64 encoded, um, you're just making sure that any of the objects which are pulled into the code base, um, they're updated and have no known vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Like that as well so ultimately hopefully that gives everyone a little bit of a tour to understand how do teams operate to be able to protect platforms or entities or businesses that are more likely to be hacked by uber hackers or nation states at hacks uh, nation state state attacks apologies um, but ultimately i really hope that that gives anyone a bit of an overview in terms of how we at robo should have helped to protect ourselves um, from cybersecurity incidents so thanks ever so much for watching